All right, good morning, everybody. All right, that was a little live, but we'll try that again. Good morning, everybody. There we go. Okay, okay. So this morning, we're going to be doing a message called uh, Jesus Did Stranger Things. There's this uh, Netflix original series uh, called Stranger Things, and it came out last year, and it was a big hit. And so this uh, past Friday, they just released the second uh, series of it, the second season. And so uh, Bart and I were basically binge-watching it yesterday and having a good time watching it. And so uh, just a little bit of what the show is about. The message actually has absolutely nothing to do with the TV show itself. It's just kind of a catchy... Uh, tagline for it. But the, uh, the, the TV show is basically about this boy who gets lost and he's like in this other dimension and his mom is, is trying to communicate with him and trying to get in touch with him and uh, everyone thinks she's lost her mind at this point because she's stringing up like Christmas lights throughout the house because every time a light turns on it's like she knows he's there or trying to communicate so she puts like the alphabet on the wall so that way he could like spell stuff out and uh, you know it's such a beautiful imagery though of how this parent is going through everything she can to try and figure out how to communicate with with her lost son and you know as children of God, we understand that sometimes we go through seasons where we're lost and where we're in the season where we might be distanced, but God does everything he can to communicate with us, and that's a beautiful thing. And so, so that's just a little bit about what the TV show is about. If you want to know more, come find me afterwards. We'll talk about it. But um, today, like I said, the, the message is called Jesus Did Stranger Things. And so this first passage that I want to share with you guys is uh, from 1 Peter 2.9. Uh, and I'll read the New Living Translation. I'll tell you uh, what I found very interesting about the King James Version as well. So uh, this passage says, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Uh, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God as he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And you know what I love uh, where it says you're God's own possession. In the, New King James, or in the King James Version, it says you are a peculiar people. Okay, I don't know about you. Whenever somebody calls me peculiar... It's not always a good thing. It's usually because they're saying I'm weird. You know what I mean? Because at work, I'm a very weird person. You should ask Tori. All the people who sit in the cubicles next to us always are like, Dan is just such a weirdo. But, you know, and in this passage, you've got to keep in mind the context and understand the passage and what it's saying. Peculiar is not meant as a negative connotation. It's saying that we're different. We're set apart. But you know what I mean? You ever, you ever see somebody and your thought and your mind is, they're peculiar. You know, you're thinking they're a little, a little weird. You know what I mean? And uh, to be honest, even the word peculiar, it was kind of difficult. You know, like with uh, your some of the newer phones you can click and have it speech you know write it out for you or whatever I had such a struggle even saying the word peculiar the other day for some reason because I'm I'm a strange person but anyway um, so you know I want us to think about that what that means to be different to be set apart that's what peculiar means we are different and so when we look at uh, Jesus in the Bible and we look at who Jesus is and the things that he did Jesus did some strange stuff and that that first blank in there is that uh, Jesus did strange things and so this first part that we're going to be taking a look at is, um, is on our slides, and that's that Jesus thought outside the box. And so there's this passage where Jesus heals a blind man. And uh, I preached on this passage a couple times. I did some research on it last night. It just always intrigues me with how Jesus approached certain situations. And so uh, we're just going to look at parts of these passages. Some of the passages I'm just going to reference. I have them there in your outline so you can go dig deeper into the scriptures later. But uh, we're going to take a look here um, at John 9, 1 through 12. I'm going to kind of skip in and out of different areas. So basically, Jesus encountered this blind man and uh, his disciples were questioning and they said uh, in the one passage they said why was this man born blind was it because of his own sins or the sins of his parents this is not because of the sins of his parents Jesus answered this happened so the power of God could be seen in him you know what sometimes we miss the point Sometimes when we look at a situation, we look at uh, uh, what's going on in certain situations, we miss the point of what's actually going on. Because his disciples were so convinced and so caught up in this other mindset that it was because of his sin that he had no vision. And, and God is saying, no, 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 that's not the case. It's because, because God came as Jesus to in his flesh to be able to show his power that he could heal this man. And uh, as the, the passage progresses, uh, we see that Jesus did something strange here. He didn't, you know, Jesus had the power to just say, be healed, boom, his eyes, good to go. And he had a clean bill of health and he was good from there. But Jesus did something different. When we take a look in this uh, uh, upcoming passage, it says, Then Jesus spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud 
over the blind man's eyes and then told him to go, wa- he said, go wash yourself in the pool of Shalom. Shalom means sin. And so I want you to think about that. Just kind of put yourself in this man's uh, position for a moment. You know, you're blind since birth. You can't see. And, you know, you can only hear things. And, you know, oh, you find out Jesus is in town. So that's exciting. But then all of a sudden, you know, you're, Jesus is nearby. And you're thinking, yeah, oh, maybe you'll heal me. It's just going to say be healed and I'm done. But imagine you're blind. You can't see anything. And you just hear, <sighs> What in the world? I'd be freaking out because, I mean, uh, you know, that's gross. That's disgusting. But Jesus did that. He spit and he made the mud and he put it over the blind man's eyes. And, and you know, Jesus did things different. He shook things up. And, you know, I've, I've read into it and I, I've heard some different opinions about how and why he did that. You know, that as God made man out of dust, maybe that he was trying to use. You know, there's a lot of different conclusions to take away from that. But, you know, even with all the depth of spirituality and theology aside from it, that was weird. Like, that was a weird thing. But Jesus was not afraid to step outside of the box. And as we go through this message today, I want us to realize that when Jesus did things, he was doing them as an example for us. Because as Christians, we are supposed to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. So we cannot get comfortable. We can't stay in our comfort zones and do business as usual and do church as usual. But we need to get out of our comfort zones. I'm not saying that we need to run into 44 and Kingston and start spitting in people's eyeballs, because that's definitely a no-go. We will get arrested for that. But I am saying that we need to think differently. We need to be like Jesus and approach things in a different light. And uh, so we're going to look at this, uh, this next point. And so Jesus did strange things. We look at um, Jesus went against the social grain, okay? You know, there were things in the culture, there were things in that time and that place with Jewish culture and the things that were going on. And often he shook things up. He did things differently and they were strange to people. They were very odd. And so this first uh, uh, thing we're going to look at is the woman at the well. And you, like I said, you can look at these passages later to dig deeper into it, but it is in John chapter 4. And so the woman at the well, this is a Samaritan woman, and you need to understand the context that Jesus was a Jew And this woman was a Samaritan. So culturally, not really uh, getting along, not really communicating a lot. They, They really viewed each other very differently. And so... When Jesus sat down with this woman, he was able to, uh, uh, to communicate with her and, and, and strike up a conversation. And this woman was like, wait, why are you speaking to me? Like, first of all, I'm a Samaritan. And second of all, you know, like, what, what are you talking about? This is like such a weird situation. And so Jesus started to, to communicate with this woman it, despite their cultural differences. And he sat down and he used something common that was right in front of the, them, which was the well. And he said, you know, hey, can you draw me some water? And, you know, they start communicating. He said, you know, I, I, I have the water that you'll never be thirsty again. And you know what? He was using something common to be able to communicate in a way that she understood. And she was so excited to know. And he knew everything about this woman. He knew everything in her heart. He knew everything in her past. And despite the fact that she had had, you know, X amount of husbands and was living with a man that she wasn't married to, despite those circumstances, he spoke to her heart first and said, you know what? You know, go and sin no more. Listen to what I have to say. I have the water that will never run dry. I am the water of life. And so that is so important to look at how Jesus did not care about those cultural barriers. He went straight and talked to this woman and shared the truth in love. And that's such an important thing. And so this next passage is in uh, uh, Matthew. And it's when Jesus flipped the temple tables. This is one of my favorite verses because I think about that. I'm like, oh my gosh, could you imagine being in the temple? And which, fun fact, I did some research last night and found out my mindset was a little bit wrong on this in the past. It wasn't like Jesus ran into the main temple. It was actually in the, uh, the courtyards, actually in the, the temple area. So he didn't just like run into the church service and start, you know, flipping stuff and getting reckless. Uh, he actually was in the temple yard. So at that time, uh, there were the money changers and these people that were, uh, uh, were selling things for sacrifices because, you know, at that time they had to have a pure animal and some of these people were making a voyage from a far distance. And so if they had to bring their uh, lamb or sheep or whatever they, they were sacrificing and it got nipped in the ear by a wolf or something happened like that, it was considered impure. So they couldn't. They had to go and they had to buy these things. And so we're just going to take a look at one part here in uh, um, 
uh, Matthew 21, 12, and 13. It says, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people, buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer, and you have turned it into a den of thieves. And the interesting part is he's actually referencing a passage in the Old Testament, which is in uh, Jeremiah 7, 11. And uh, it says, don't, don't yourself admit uh, sorry, don't you yourself admit that this temple, which bears my name, has become a den of thieves? Surely I will see all this evil going on there. I, the Lord, have spoken. And so he's referencing and saying, you know, in the past when the temple was, you know, destroyed, it was because of the evil things, the corruption that was going on. And uh, I, I love this passage because, you know, Jesus was exuding righteous anger. There's a difference between regular anger that's of the flesh and righteous anger. Because he wasn't getting upset over menial things that didn't matter, like the color of the carpet or a pew or a style of music or whatever you may have. You know, those things are our preferences that are kind of nitpicky that don't really matter. But Jesus was upset because there was corruption in the church. There was corruption in the temple and he had righteous anger. And you know, maybe everybody else, the other religious leaders over a certain period of time, they got comfortable and maybe they were like, you know, I don't really want to say anything because it's just going to rock the boat and you know then people might not come to church anymore you know like there, he was thinking that you know all these people might have been thinking that the pharisees and these religious leaders but jesus who is the son of god saw his father's house being mistreated and saw it being mistreated in a way that there was corruption and he dealt with that he was not afraid to speak up about things that were going on that were corrupt that were wrong and he he did that in a very abrasive way and so this next uh, thing where Jesus did stranger things and he went against the grain, we look at this passage uh, in, in John 8, 7, where uh, the woman was caught in the act of adultery. And so I'm just going to share a little bit uh, of this passage in John 8, where, where it says, uh, uh, as Jesus was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. So I'm just going to pause there for a second. I was talking uh, uh, with uh, my friend Bart last night, and we were talking about this passage, and First of all, let's just like realize she was caught in the act of adultery. And you know, so they're trying to bring this woman to be condemned with Jesus. But you know, sometimes I take a look at the scriptures and ask some of the questions that might not get asked a lot. But how was she caught in the act of adultery? You know, like these Pharisees, these religious leaders, you know, they're coming here trying to, to get Jesus in trouble. But they're the ones who are kind of creeping on people and being weirdos. So it's just like, you know, this is, a, this is a weird situation and they're trying to bring this woman forward. And, you know, I know maybe I'm, I'm strange. I just think of these things. But I'm like, how did this actually come to be? And so they drag this woman out and uh, they, they bring her in front of, of Jesus. And, they, you know, they, they say, you know, you're the teacher of religious law that the law of Moses says this. Now, what do you say? And uh, I just love this passage because Jesus just, you know, stoops down in the, in, in the dirt and he starts writing. And, you know, there's a lot of different uh, um, people that are very into philosophy and, and uh, um, uh, theology and have talked about what maybe he was writing. It doesn't really matter. I mean, we can always, you know, have our imagination to think maybe he was writing their names or maybe uh, he knew one of the Pharisees was, you know, you know, at the strip club or something and he was writing his name in the mud. You know, like there could have been, I saw you tossing shekels in the club. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, you know, there was these things going on and he maybe he knew exactly what was going on and he was writing their sins in the dirt. Who knows what it is and that's not as important as the context, but the point of that whole passage was that even though the law of Moses, the culture, the law of that time said to stone her to death, he stopped and said, who is without sin? Go ahead and cast the first stone. And Jesus, being righteous, being fully man, but fully God, righteous, never sinning, had the right to stone this woman, but he did not. And, and he didn't just stop there and say, okay, go ahead, keep living your promiscuous lifestyle and keep going doing your thing. But Jesus addressed the issue that was that the culture decided that the, she should die. He addressed that issue, but then he addressed the issue of this woman's heart. And he said, go and sin no more. He gave her a second chance. Where she should have physically died, she had a chance to live again. And where she spiritually was dead, she had a chance to spiritually live again. And so Jesus was not afraid to be different, to be strange, and to go against the social grain. And so this uh, second point is that Jesus encountered stranger things, okay? He encountered a lot of weird things during his time in ministry uh, here on earth. And so this first point, is that uh, um, Jesus encountered interruptions. We're going to look at two examples here. Uh, the man being lowered into the roof. And there's this passage um, here in... in uh 
Sorry, I got lost for a second. So there's this passage here in Luke 5, 17 through 38. So I'm going to kind of skip in and out, and we're going to take a look at this passage. And so uh, we're going to start off here, Luke 5, 17. If you have your Bibles, you can open them and follow along as well. So Luke 5, 17. It says, One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. And, you know, I like to call the Pharisees the haters because that's really what they were. You know what I mean? Like they knew that like Jesus was trying to to do what he was doing. And these guys, they were the haters. And so anytime you're trying to do something that God is calling you to do, the haters are going to show up. You know, these people that are against you, the enemy and these other people, they're going to show up. And so, so Jesus is showing up to teach. Uh, and, it see, and then it says after this, it says, It seems that these men showed up from every village in Galilee and, and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was, uh, was strongly with Jesus. And so at this point, you know, so Jesus is meeting in this house and he's getting prepared, you know, he's preaching this sermon. It says his healing power was strong. And so people were probably, you know, nearby like, wow, I have this ailment. I have this thing here. I have this. And, you know, people were probably coming to be healed, but they're also coming to hear this, uh, the, the word of God and hear the truth of God's word. And so, and of course, the religious leaders are there taking their notes, right, trying to figure out how they could, they could nail him for, for saying something wrong or doing something wrong. And they're always trying to scheme against him. And so we're going to skip ahead here to verse 20. It said, seeing, uh, uh, oh, and then right at this point, so there was a, a man and his friends, the, the crippled man, and they were up on the roof because it was so packed. There's so many people there. And this man had to be lowered down through the roof. So they had to move the tiles. They had to cut into the roof. And they had, just think about that. Imagine this place is jam-packed. There's no way to get in. And all these people are trying to hear God's word, which would be awesome. But, you know, so imagine that. That's going on. And all of a sudden, you hear a chainsaw up on the roof. And you're like, what in the heck is going on? And then imagine somebody is lowering a gurney down into the middle of the service. Like, what the heck? You know, I have ADHD, so I don't know how I would recover from that because I'd be so distracted. I'd be like, I don't even know what I was preaching on at this point. But Jesus didn't have ADHD, so we're good. So, um, but you know, at that point, this is what's going on. And so we're going to skip ahead here to verse 20. Uh, it says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and the teachers, the haters, of religious law said to them, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go. So you realize these people are scheming against him. And Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking, and he was able to speak straight to it. And so imagine the distractions, the things, the encountered interruptions. Because sometimes we go through life and we have interruptions. You know, uh, for me, you know, sometimes it can be like little things or it can be big things. Like yesterday, I was going and uh, I went to go get a movie from Redbox. So I drove into Wilkes-Barre to find this one Redbox that had a movie. And I, I got in my car, completely fine. I got out of my car, completely fine. I go to open the car door and the door will not open from the inside or the outside. Like the, literally the mechanism inside the door is just not working. And if you know me, I have a history of car problems. So this is like a very frustrating thing. And so yesterday I'm like, you know, I'm trying to be all spiritual and preparing for my sermon, being in a good attitude. And I go to open my door and I'm like, this is bad. This is bad. And, you know, and I have to exercise this stuff that I'm preaching. It's very difficult sometimes. But, you know, we encounter interruptions. Sometimes it might be something small, like your car is, is being dysfunctional. But sometimes it might be an interruption in life where things are chaotic and these things are going on in your life and you don't know how to handle these interruptions. And we look at God and we look at God's word and we look at what Jesus has said and what he did in the Bible. And we can really see that, you know, he was able to look distractions in the face and deal with these distractions in the name of Jesus and his name. He was able to deal with these things. And so we're going to take a look at uh, another passage here. We're going to look at uh, Mark 5. In your, in your outlines, it's a different verse, uh, which is uh, a long story. But this is one of the other passages that I wanted to reference uh, here in Mark 5. And so basically, uh, they were going across the water on a boat, Jesus and his disciples, and they were heading to this area. And then they encountered this demon-possessed man. And a little background on this man. He was uh, possessed by a legion of, uh, of demons. And, and it's going to reference that here in a moment. But he was, he was so uh, uh, possessed 
possessed by these demons that they could not hold him with shackles. He would break the shackles off. He would break the chains and break the shackles and they could not contain this man. So this guy has gone completely AWOL. He's possessed and like nobody in town knows how to deal with this guy. And so uh, luckily, you know, Jesus is coming into town at this point. And so we're going to take a look here at uh, Mark 5. And I'm going to start in chapter 7 and go through 13. It says, with a, a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the Most High? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of that man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion because we are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirit begged him again not to, stand, or not to send him into a distant, distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and, uh, and the entire herd of 2,000 pigs plunged into a stream, uh, a, into the hillside, into the lake, and drowned in the water. So imagine this. First, first interruption, this demon-possessed crazy dude starts running at him and he's screaming and carrying on and this legions of demons are inside of him. So interruption number one. And can you imagine as the disciples like being freaked out? I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen even a commercial where there's like one of those movies where there's like a demon-possessed person. It's like, that, that's pretty terrifying, you know what I mean? And this isn't just one demon, this is a legion of demons inside of this man. And so when Jesus encountered this, he, he didn't run. He wasn't scared. He addressed the issue. And that's why, you know, the point of how Jesus encountered strange things and how he dealt with interruptions, he, he called it out. And could you imagine, I, this is kind of a sidebar, but still, this is the way my mind thinks. Can you imagine being the people that were like with the pigs, that were watching the pigs, like that's their job. And they're sitting there like, oh, all we got to do is watch the pigs. This is an easy job. And then, you know, Jesus shows up into town and then demons start flying out. And then the pigs jump into the water and just, you know, kill themselves. And you're like, oh, I had a job, and, like, this is, this is a crazy situation. Like, that, you know, that, that is some strange stuff. That is crazy. But, you know, that's, that's a stuff. And sometimes we forget that these weird, wild stories are in the Bible. And, you know, there's some crazy things to take away from it. But the important part is how Jesus dealt with inter interruptions. And we need to take those things very seriously. And so we're going to look at, at two more points uh, inside of this that says that Jesus encountered difficult choices. We're going to look at Matthew uh, 4, 11, uh, 1 through 11. And this is the, the story about how uh, Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert. And so I'm going to go ahead and read through this passage. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. Okay, pause. So 40 days and 40 nights this man, you know, Jesus is fasting. I don't know about you, but like if I fast for one day, okay, I'll be honest, if I miss one meal, I am cranky. I don't know how I can handle anything. But Jesus at this point has fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So, you know, I, sometimes we need to put ourselves in those shoes to realize how amazing God is and how amazing Jesus is and what he actually did, you know. So he fasted for 40 days, 40 nights, and he was led into the, to w the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And so uh, we take a look here. It says, During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city of, uh, in Jerusalem, to the high point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off, for the scriptures say, He will order the angels to protect you, and, and they will hold you up with every hand, so you won't even hurt your foot uh, on a stone." Jesus responded, The scriptures also say that you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of the high mountain and showed him every kingdom of the world and their glory. I will give, you, I will give it all to you, he said, if you kneel down and worship me. Get, on, get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and 
serve only him. The devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. Could you imagine that? You know, first of all, the first part, you know, where he's saying you could turn the, the stone into bread. He could have turned the stone into Chick-fil-A if he wanted, but he decided, he, you know, he decided to go with the word of God. You know what I'm saying? So there's all these distractions and, and how he had to encounter these difficult choices because he's hungry, he's tired, and he's, you know, I would be delirious after that amount of time, but he stayed focused on God's word. And even though Satan, which you have to realize, Satan does know the Bible and he knows the Bible very well because that's how he uses it to trick Christians because he contorts and twists the word of God into something that's not accurate and not true. And so how he encountered these difficult choices you know, he had to know the word of God. And, you know, as followers of Jesus, we need to follow in his footsteps and be good stewards of our time to where we are investing in the truth of God's word. And then when something arises in our culture and our time that contradicts that word, we know the truth of God's word and we can stand firmly on it. And just like Jesus did in this passage. And so uh, I'm going to be closing with this last point here. And, uh, you know, Jesus encountered difficult choices and forgiving those who were killing him had to have been one of the most difficult, you know, and I, I was praying um, before this service, and I don't know, God was, was definitely speaking to my heart, and really uh, kind of calling me out a little bit, because sometimes I, I think about how this is an extreme situation, like, this is, like, one of the most difficult things you'd have to do. It's not, you know, somebody who has done you wrong in the past, but, like, somebody who is actively killing you, who is spitting on you, mocking you, and saying all these ridiculous things to you, and yet you look them in the face and say, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And, you know, sometimes we can get caught up on such petty things. You know, for instance, this morning I had something that offended me, and I was a little bit upset about it. And I, I had to, like, pray back there before I even came up here to realize that, you know, why, why should I get so caught up on something so small? I think that sometimes in the church, just because, you know, we're around each other a lot, and we, you know, we're so used to things a certain way, sometimes we can get offended, and we can get caught up in things really easily. And you know what? We need to learn to forgive one another. We need to learn how to approach one another and be able to show the love of God. Because one, you realize that these people hated Jesus, didn't even agree with him, didn't believe that he was the son of God. They were making fun of him. They were killing him. And Jesus looked him in the face and said, forgive them for they know not what they do. But yet sometimes we as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ with that same common ground, can look at each other and harvest bitterness and harvest these negative emotions towards each other instead of dealing with them and talking to each other and trying to understand, hey, we're, we're all on the same team here. We're all here for the same mission to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this, that strange things that happened in the Bible, and they're still happening today, strange things are happening all around us, but how did Jesus deal with these things? How did Jesus encounter difficult choices and how did he deal with them? You know, we need to take a look at ourselves. We need to take a look at what we're doing and not dictate it off of our feelings and our emotions because they will lead you wildly astray every single time. But we need to look at God's word and set that as a center point of where we're going and how we're going to handle things in this church and as individuals of Jesus Christ that are followers of Jesus Christ. And so uh, I just want to go back to that first passage one more time and just share that again, that we are a peculiar people we are God's chosen generation. We are a peculiar people. Look to your neighbor and say, you're weird. There we go. People are like, wait, wait, I might offend somebody. I might, all right, let's all take a deep breath. It's okay. We can, we can say things at church. It's okay. You know, but we need to realize we are a peculiar people. We're set apart. We're different. We have a God who has done some amazing, strange things in the Bible, and he still wants to do them through us today. You know, there's not many churches that are going to go out in a church parking lot on Tuesday night and set up for a trunk or treat. You know, there, there are churches out there that are doing that, don't get me wrong, but we're, we're one of the few in the area that does that, and that's not to put us on a pedestal, but it's saying that's one thing. Let's keep going. What else can we do that might be different, that, you know— short of sin, you know, obviously we're not going to do anything that's immoral. We're not going to do anything that's, you know, that's contradicting God's word. But we need to start thinking, how can we as the body of Christ, how can we as the church do something different, be peculiar, be different? And we need to think about that. So as I pray, I just want you to reflect on that. How can I be peculiar in my personal life, in my church, 
And as the body of Christ, how can we come together to not be divided by little things that don't matter, but to be united for the cause of Christ, to spread the gospel? And so let's just pray, and I just want us to just take a couple of seconds, just meditate on that. How can we be peculiar? Let's bow our heads. Dear God, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you that you made a weirdo such as myself. Lord, I thank you that you've made all the weird people in this church. God, we thank you for, for what you've done uh, so far in this church. And God, I thank you that you're not done yet, that you have so much more planned. And so, Father God, I just pray that uh, as we go home after this, Lord, that we wouldn't just uh, uh, think about a service that's just here on Sunday morning, but God, let us take that message with us home, that we need to start thinking outside of the box, that we need to be the peculiar people that the Word of God was talking about. And Lord, I just pray that we would be able to open our hearts and, and open our minds. And God, I just pray, uh, I, pr I pray specifically for a spirit of unity in this church. God, I pray that the, the small things wouldn't divide us, the small things wouldn't separate us, but God, that nothing can separate us from your love. And if your love is in this place, then there's a spirit of unity in this place. And so God, I pray for your word to be so prevalent in our hearts and so prevalent in our lives that we literally are reflecting your son Jesus into this world and into this congregation. And so, God, I thank you for this time, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to open your word today. God, I pray that we would be able to uh, walk out of here different than the way we walked in. God, I pray that you would uh, uh, continue to work on our hearts throughout the week. And, Lord, we just uh, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.